Oracle software uh, over the year. I I began uh, I began my career as a, as an accountant uh, and uh, spent a lot of time working with IT teams on financial systems. And uh, after a while, they uh, kind of figured out that uh, hey, this guy sort of knows what's going on. They asked me to become a developer, so uh, I spent a number of years uh, working as a developer on uh, PeopleSoft ERP system, and then had the opportunity to get into the uh, business intelligence realm. And uh, since that time, have spent uh, a great deal of time with the uh, with the Oracle database. So. Uh, obviously, that's uh, that's going to be the database technology that we focus on this semester, and um, I think the the concepts and, and stuff that we learn uh, using the Oracle database, you'll really be able to uh, apply across multiple database platforms. Uh, but uh, I happen to be well versed in it, and it is one of the uh, database platforms that is deployed largely across the world. And uh, so I think it's a it's a great platform to to learn about. So um, if uh, if you guys don't mind, I wouldn't. Uh, I'd like to just kind of go down the list and uh, and have some of you uh, introduce yourselves a little bit. Tell me a little bit about yourself and give me an idea of uh, kind of what you know about database administration so far, and then and what you're hoping to get out of the out of the course. Uh, this semester, so um, I can. Uh, I'll. I'll let me struggle uh, terribly with names here. Is it? Is it Chethan? Uh, hi, Chethan. Yeah. Hey, that's Chethan. Yeah. Chethan. All right. Go ahead. Introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and what you do. So. Uh, I'm from India. Uh, I have been uh, studying my master's in UNO. This is my second year. And I'm doing my uh, management information systems. So uh, related to DBA, actually initially I had worked for around uh, uh, just uh, six months in a company as a trainee Oracle DBA. So I have a bit of touch on uh, DBA tasks. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, next person I see on my list is uh, HK. Uh, hello. Hi this there. Is here. Uh, uh, this is HK. I'm pursuing a master's in uh, information systems, and uh, DBA is new new concept to me, and uh, I would learn to understand the backend concepts of database. Uh, as I understand the front end things in the Dr. Walcott's class, I would expect some administrative uh, things and concepts uh, in your class. All right, great. Well, Thank I you. can promise you guys that you are going to get some back end uh, experience with this stuff. Uh, I'm going to throw you right in the deep yeah. end and uh, see if you can swim. So, uh, all right, uh, Kavya is the next person I see on the list. And I know some of you uh, may or may not uh, have your microphone set up, so I'll give you a second. And Oops. There you yeah, go. I figured. I figured that just now. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Mr. Dayton, um, I'm a graduate student uh, majoring in MIS. Um, uh, my previous database um, experience is just with um, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Walcott's class, uh, the database management class. And um, uh, the reason why I enrolled into this class was to, you know, try and dig deeper into databases and try and learn more concepts on the same. So I do not, I have worked on SAP before uh, for about two, two and a half years, but uh, no proper um, database experience though. All right, well, we'll get you some proper database experience, I promise. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, uh, next person I see is, uh, is it Mandeep? I 
Let's see, and you might still be muted. Oh, okay. Uh, Mandeep says his uh, microphone is not working, but uh, he says he's pursuing his uh, master's in uh, MIS and uh, and uh, has worked as a performance and capacity analyst for about two years and, and got a change to work with the Oracle DB team team and knows the basics of uh, Oracle database architecture. Great. All right. So I think the next person I see is uh, Parveen. Uh, my name is Praveen and I'm a master's student. I have some experience in the market research firm and working with some database tool like SQL Server, SQL Queries, not more than that. And this subject is new for me, so working with the Oracle database. And I, I took the last semester at World Code class. I have some pretty experience of that class, not more than that. That's it. Okay, great. Yep. All right, next person I see is uh, Sunny. Hi. Hi, I'm Sunny Mukati, and uh, I'm also pursuing MIS and Masters, and this is my last semester. I'll be graduating this fall, and I took this class out of interest because uh, actually I have experience of data analysis and testing, but I am more inclined towards database and such stuff. All right. Well, great. I love uh, database stuff too, and actually sort of uh, wandered into it uh, for, uh, mm -hmm. for the pure interest of it, and uh, have very much oh. enjoyed being involved in, in database development and trying to convince DBAs to let people touch their databases. So I'm sure I'll uh, I'll bring that up a lot this semester. <laughs> All right, last person I see here okay. is, uh, is TP. Hey guys, my name is Tim. Uh, Tim Flug. Uh, I'm uh, getting my bachelor's in management information systems this uh, winter, so this is my last semester here. I don't really have any uh, a ton of experiences with databases other than using like Microsoft Access for our capstone project a few semesters ago, as well, and um, a little bit of Microsoft ODBC at my internship. But other than that, I'm mostly just have an interest in it. Okay. Great. Well, you know, I actually cut my teeth on Microsoft Access way back in the day when I was just trying to make uh, my life as a uh, as an accountant easier. And uh, a lot of people sort of look at Access as, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of deride it. And uh, I'm probably guilty of that myself at times. But it's probably one of, uh, you know, the most accessible little databases out there. And uh, I don't necessarily have anything against it from a, from a learning perspective. Um, it is is not an enterprise grade solution though, and that's typically where folks run into <laughs> to issues with it is when they try to deploy it like it is. But uh, it's a great little tool. So that's great. I'm I'm glad to hear uh, that all of you are are interested in learning uh, more about. Uh, databases because uh, I'm pretty passionate about them. I'm also pretty passionate about uh, understanding that the database is a, is a development platform. So uh, a lot of folks seem to think that a database's uh, only purpose in life is to uh, store data, you know, and answer queries. And the uh, fact of the matter is, it's uh, it's for a lot. It's it has way more power than that, and it is probably the most powerful development platform that uh, any organization has and also is typically the uh, the least utilized in that uh, in that respect as well so uh, I hope to give you some perspective on that as we go through the semester but first thing I want to do is just kind of help you figure out um, how it is to, to, to get one going and and uh, and to start uh, learning about it so uh, I am a huge proponent of learn by doing, right? Uh, I don't believe in kind of talking, uh, uh, you know, forever about, oh, geez, you know, you know, read this book and these 12 chapters, and then, you know, after six weeks, we'll, we'll touch the thing. Uh, I expect you guys to be, uh, have a database that you installed yourself uh, up and running uh, inside of a month, and really, uh, your first assignment, which is due here in geez, less than two weeks is, is going to be getting the uh, base platform 
uh, that you need to install a database on up and running utilizing uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, one of the things I intend to teach you about this semester is, is cloud computing, right? That's all the rage these days. Uh, Amazon Web Services is one amongst uh, many vendors who provide uh, infrastructure, cloud infrastructure that you can use as the basis of, uh, of your really uh, computing uh, infrastructure, right? So we're going to get that out there and learn how to use it. I'm also going to force you to use Linux if you haven't used it before because uh, another big thing that is very popular in the software world these days is open source and probably one of the most successful uh, open source projects out there has been the Linux operating system. And uh, I can promise you that if you're going to be involved with really software at all, but especially databases over time, you are probably going to uh, need to learn how to use Linux. Uh, so uh, I want to just sort of get rid of the fear uh, with Linux. A lot of folks, when they approach it, if they haven't used it before, are kind of scared of it. Uh, they see command line um, interfaces and they're like, oh Lord, I can't do this. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, command line type stuff, but then we're going to move into a, uh, a desktop environment on top of Linux. And uh, then I think uh, you all get pretty comfortable with it. Uh, as an aside, if, uh, if you have a Mac computer, you're, you're already a Linux user. You just maybe didn't know about it. So, uh, Lastly, we're going to learn how to install and administer an Oracle Bay uh, database. So when I say you're going to install it, that means you're going to install it. Uh, um, like I said, learn by doing is the approach that I'm going to take. And uh, I'm going to make sure that by the end of this semester, you are comfortable with being able to deploy the infrastructure in the cloud that you need to uh, operate an Oracle database or really uh, any software. And then I'm also going to make sure that you're comfortable with uh, installing and really uh, getting in there and, 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 and messing with the database, right? Because the way that you learn how to use these things and the way that you become a professional is just messing around with it. So uh, you're going to get your hands dirty and uh, we're going we're gonna to dive right in starting tonight with this stuff. So uh, how to be successful this semester, the, the biggest thing I'm going to tell you is, is start fast, right? The first two assignments are going to be uh, getting your Amazon instance set up, and then the second assignment is going to be installing a database. All of your other assignments will be 100% dependent on you uh, getting the first two assignments done. So if you can't do the first two assignments, you're going to be hosed. Uh, but you can do it, uh, but you don't want to mess around and, and wait for uh, the last second to get these done. The, the other thing about the first two assignments in this course is they're going to compose uh, like 40% of your grade. So um, you want to make sure you're successful with these. And um, uh, basically, if you can get your database up and running on Amazon Web Services, then you're going to get all the points for that 40% uh, of your grade. So, uh, you know, make sure that you, you dive in head first and, and get those first two assignments going. And I think you're going to be uh, successful in this course. Uh, I'm not going to give you a midterm or a final, or I probably won't even give you any quizzes. Uh, your work is really going to determine your grade, right? Uh, this is going to be learned by doing. Uh, we're going to be administering a database. Uh, there's going to be a number of assignments which are uh, based off of uh, exploring the system that you create, uh, but really it, it's up to you how well you do in this class, which uh, I've always been a big fan of, of being judged by uh, my own work because uh, I've always been kind of successful with that model, and, uh, and you will be too as long as you uh, sort of follow along. And I promise that I'm going to show you how to do everything that we're doing in this course, and uh, and if, uh, if you'll come along for the ride with me, I promise that you'll be successful at it. So uh, what are you going to need? Uh, there's uh, really a couple of pieces of software, and then mostly just a web browser is, is really all you're going to need. Um, MOBA Xterm is, is a great uh, SSH client, and it does a lot of other things. 
uh, for Windows based uh, users. For those of you using Mac, um, really the only thing that we're going to need to be doing is, is connecting to our Amazon instance with an uh, SSH client. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Mac has one built right in, and I, I put an announcement out there about that. If not, you know, uh, Putty or really any SSH client will work for what we need to do uh, from a command line perspective, really getting our environment in AWS set up and, and moving along. Uh, the other piece of software that you'll need, and thankfully this is something that works on, they have versions for both Windows and uh, Mac and Linux and just about any other operating system you might possibly have is the real VNC viewer. So we're gonna create a computer in the cloud and uh, we're going to set up a, a desktop environment on it and then we're gonna use our VNC viewer to connect to it. Um, and then really all of the work that you do um, after we get to that point is going to be on this remote computer. And uh, this is just going to be like a remote desktop uh, sort of scenario. So um, really, if we can get you all set up with that, you'll be ready to go. You won't have to be concerned about how fast is my computer or how much space I have. Uh, we're going to be using all cloud resources to, to handle this stuff. Uh, the other thing you're going to need is an Oracle account. Those things are free to sign up for. I've noticed just the past couple of days that Oracle's websites seem to be really slow. So if some of you are experiencing that, uh, I'm imagining that will be a temporary uh, scenario. But in any case, uh, just go sign up for an Oracle account, and this will allow you to download their software. Uh, one of the great parts about Oracle, uh, I guess when you're, you're not an enterprise having to buy their software for bazillions of dollars, is they provide all sorts, of, they provide basically all of their software uh, free to developers to, to mess with, right? So they want you to try it, they want you to use it, they want you to get hooked on it, and then they want you to eventually, uh, you know, want to use this for your enterprise and, uh, and then give them lots of money. Uh, I've always uh, liked that about Oracle because um, they make their stuff accessible. You don't have to talk to anybody to download it and install it. Uh, really, the only thing you you'll, you have to do is be uh, willing to uh, kind of learn about it. But if you want to learn about Oracle software, you can do it for nothing uh, if you just have enough um, patience to sort of work through it. Uh, and the great part is there's a lot of communities out there of people who uh, spend a lot of time helping people, uh, you know, learn how to use their their Oracle software. And I'm one of those people that tries to do that because uh, ultimately I make my living off of that stuff. So uh, I want you to think it's cool. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you're gonna need an Amazon Web Services account and you will need a credit card to sign up for this. I'm gonna show you tonight in, in hooking this thing up uh, that you won't need to spend very much uh, money this semester on your AWS account. Uh, I think I said in, in the syllabus that you might need 20 or 30 bucks this semester. Honestly, uh, I would expect that number to be high. Uh, the key to um, uh, not spending tons of money on your AWS account is shutting off your virtual machines when you're not using them. And uh, I'll show you how to do that. I'll also show you how to set up a billing alert. So if, I don't know, you just fall asleep and forget to think, turn the thing off for three weeks, it'll at least send you an email and say, hey, uh, you spent 10 bucks on this thing, you might wanna go shut it off. And then uh, we will be working along um, the uh, textbook I have here on my screen. And um, I, somebody uh, alerted me the other day that the uh, Mavlink has a link to the wrong book, but then apparently the bookstore has the right book, and uh, and then you can you can find this book online. Uh, it's available via Kindle, which I think is the way I bought it, um, and it, it's pretty affordable. I think it's like thirty five forty dollars uh, for the Kindle version of the book, and uh, that'll be fine if if you happen to find it another way for cheaper than uh, than good for you. Uh, you will be needing the book though because uh, we're going to do a lot of 
uh, stuff out of it. So uh, it's important that you get it. So uh, the big thing to realize is it's uh, we're going to be using the 12C version of the Oracle database, which is the latest and greatest version of it. Um, so uh, if you have an 11G version of the book, it's really not going to be that useful. Um, I mean, you could probably get by with it, but there's a lot of new things in, in the 12C database that uh, just simply didn't exist in, in the 11G version. So that's the one we're going to be using uh, this semester. So if anybody has uh, any questions, you can, you can obviously just unmute yourself and speak up. Or uh, if you want to send an IM through the, through the chat windows, I'll be, uh, try to glance over and look at that occasionally as well. So uh, diving right in, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be recording all these lectures for you guys, uh, but I definitely uh, in, encourage you to uh, speak up and ask questions. Uh, this is going to be a, a pretty challenging course this semester, so uh, I'm diving right in tonight because we gotta we got to move along pretty quick if we're going to get done what we need to get done. Uh, so I want to be honest with you from the, from the get go, and have you understand that uh, that uh, I'm. It's not going to be simple, right? Uh, I wouldn't describe it as hard or impossible, but uh, uh, I would expect you to have to, to put a little bit of time into this course. And uh, some of these uh, concepts I'm going to be teaching about may be completely and totally new to you. And uh, if that's the case with anything new, it, it takes a little bit of use getting used to. So key concept that uh, that we're dealing with really in the, in the world in general and uh, and what we're going to be doing with AWS is virtualization, right? So so what is uh, what is it, right? It, it's this idea that all of these things that used to be physical devices are becoming software based. So uh, computers, you know, used to take an operating system and install it on a server, and then that server was, uh, you know, a computer, right? And it had that operating system on it, and, and that was it. Uh, with virtualization now, uh, the idea of what a computer is really becomes muddied because a server, uh, through, the, through the means of virtualization, can actually have, you know, any number of computers uh, on it with uh, different different operating systems, and that server can allocate uh, things like RAM and processors and, and uh, what those computers need to do their work um, in sort of a round robin um, fashion. So uh, virtualization can really uh, apply to anything, and it really does when we look at uh, AWS. You know. The, the idea of what a computer is is going to get uh, kind of strange for some people, right? Because they're, they're all virtual servers out there. The storage is virtual. The networks are virtual. All these things that used to be defined by devices are now defined by uh, software, and all of the compute infrastructure is, is, uh, is abstracted so that uh, it, these things can be uh, defined. Uh, as, as software based. So uh, I like to use my phone as a perfect example of uh, what a what a um, what virtualization really is and to give some good examples of it here. So I think uh, if I try I can share my phone here. I'm going to go ahead and give that a chance or give that a try here. So there we go. Done. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna presume that you all can see my phone at this point, and uh, somebody speak up if you can't. But if we look at, uh, look at this iPhone here, right, look at all of the things here that have kind of been virtualized right off the top. I mean, at the top left corner, I've got a clock, right? This thing has been uh, virtualized, and you can see, hey, there's a stopwatch when I was running at the gym tonight, and you know this is now software-defined. Um, Music, radios, uh, DV, you know, uh, what we used to, you know, use to play music is now software defined. Cameras are now software defined, right? There's the, the, the physical 
uh, thing that used to be a camera basically no longer exists. DVD players, uh, you know, this thing uh, will do that. It also is a television now, you know, my, my, I can play Cox cable on it and basically watch TV on my phone. If I, if I look at my extras here, it has a compass on it, right? And this used to be a, a device. It has a voice recorder. All of these things are examples of, of virtualization and things that used to be, in, you know, a calculator, things that used to be entirely uh, device, you know, physical device driven things are now defined by software. The same thing is happening with uh, computers in general and then. Uh, data centers and, and really all of the infrastructure that goes into having an enterprise um, uh, enterprise data center, these things are all being virtualized. So it's a very important concept to uh, understand and uh, it's uh, the basis of, of a lot of the things that we do today in, uh, in IT and in, in working on uh, enterprise software. So I'm going to go back to sharing my PowerPoint presentation here. So, you know, what are the key properties of, of virtual machines? One of them I kind of already touched on, right? Uh, it, it's this idea of what we think of as a computer, the desktop that we interact with um, is, is, has been uh, defined by software instead of needing to be uh, defined by hardware. So you can run multiple operating systems on one physical machine and you can divide the system resources between virtual machines. And one of the key reasons that this was really developed and, and started being done is, you know, people would buy servers to install their database software and, you know, that server might have uh, eight processors on it, right? And then it could have 64 gigs of RAM and, you know, 95% of the time it's running at 2% of the capacity with uh, the software that's been installed on it. So one of the things that virtual machines allow us to do is say, well, hey, let's define eight or 10 machines on top of this server and we can get a much greater utilization out of our hardware uh, resources and we can divide those system resources between the multiple virtual machines running on top of it and uh, this allows us to really um, get a great deal more out of uh, the physical servers that are, are used in, in data centers um, the other great part about it is isolation so uh, I can have a virtual machine on a server you can have a virtual machine on the same server you can do something horrible to your for your virtual machine completely uh, face plant the whole thing and it, it doesn't matter it has no effect on me that virtual machine is is isolated and uh, whatever is going on on one doesn't necessarily affect what's going on uh, on the other and uh, it's possible with virtualization software as well to you know uh, define how much of the resources that any given program or virtual machine can consume so that uh, we can make it so that uh, what you're doing doesn't affect me uh, and my virtual machine so the other probably one of the most wonderful things about virtualization and why i'm such a huge fan of it i uh, use aws all the time and then i also have uh, vmware installed on my laptop is uh, you can save the state of your virtual machine to file so uh, why is this handy because hey I'm, I'm going to get an operating system all set up get it just the way i want it and I can save a, a snapshot of that or a picture of that virtual machine. And then if I subsequently uh, do something awful to it and screw the whole thing up, I can just revert to that snapshot and, um, and start over from that spot rather than having to completely uh, reinstall an operating system and, and start completely over. Uh, this is also great uh, for fault tolerance. If something goes horribly wrong with a machine that you've got all set up, uh, and you've got a backup from last night, you can just say, hey, revert to, to, to that state of the virtual machine and, and start from there. And uh, it's really quick and easy. And it is really the foundation of uh, you know, high availability systems and, and a lot of things that we've come to expect out of our uh, computers these days. And then the other great 
part about it is portability. Uh, I can move my virtual machines uh, from my computer to somebody else's computer. I can send one to you. Uh, I can move one up to Amazon or, or Azure or, or any of the other uh, cloud uh, providers out there that have the ability to do these types of things. So it really makes the uh, idea of, uh, of a computer uh, very portable, right? I can move that thing around and uh, I'm no longer dependent on a particular piece of hardware uh, to uh, run my my server anymore. So if I'm, I'm sick of using the laptop I have, I can save my virtual machines off to uh, some external device, buy a new laptop, uh, install the same virtualization software on that one, stick my virtual machines back on it and, and I'm ready to go. So I'm no longer, dependent on, uh, on a physical machine to run uh, my software anymore. And that is a, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, property of virtual machines. So if you, if you haven't uh, started using virtual machines, I would highly recommend it. Uh, there is a, a product out there called, um, obviously there's VMware, which sort of uh, uh, dominates the, um, enterprise world and and they're a great vendor but there's also an open source product out there called VirtualBox, which will uh is free and you can uh deploy on your your laptop and i would highly encourage you to to learn more about uh, how to use virtual machines if you haven't done it already uh, i also tell you you will learn a lot about using virtual machines on aws this semester as uh, as we go along so, you know, what is the cloud? We hear cloud all the time, cloud, cloud, cloud. Everybody's got a cloud, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, you know, it, it's, um, it's all, all over the place. And in, in reality, it isn't necessarily anything new. Uh, the, the idea, you know, the central idea behind cloud computing is, hey, uh, I'm connected to a network and therefore can use a computer that's somewhere else, right? Um, Virtualization and, and uh, a lot of other things make um, the idea of using a computer sort of not even uh, all that relevant anymore. So the, the three primary types, and I'm sure you guys have heard about this before, is software as a service. You know, you, a lot of great examples of that, just about all of your social media apps. Office 365 is a, is a great example of that. Salesforce is, an, is another great example of it. It's this idea of connecting to the internet and using a piece of software that isn't installed on my machine. I access it through a, through a browser and, uh, you know, generally I have an account with it and, uh, and I don't need to, you know, have me on any particular computer to use my software. Uh, platform as a service kind of pushes down a level and introduces the idea of being able to do, you know, development and really have a tool set for which I can I can create my own things uh, from nothing. So Salesforce is also an example of this. They have a whole development platform that goes along with their software. Uh, Office 365, if you look at uh, the SharePoint product that they offer out there with it, uh, that's a development platform. And there's, you know, an, an unending list of, uh, of these type of things. And, the, you know, the lines between software and platform as a service are not, you know, drawn in clearly. I mean, all of these things are, are kind of muddy, but we're trying to just kind of understand you know what we have and then the last one and the one that we're really concerned about this semester is going to be infrastructure as a service so amazon web services microsoft azure google oracle these are all your sort of big players with uh probably aws and microsoft and google you know being pretty far ahead amazon being the, the sort of big king of everything they've been doing it longer than than everybody and frankly are uh, I think probably still better at it uh, Microsoft has got a great platform that's come along quick Google does too and then Oracle has also uh, gotten into the game and uh, and is really focused on being able to offer all of their software offerings uh, you know 
all the way across the, the, the cloud computing paradigm. So they are offering software platform and infrastructure as a service and, and really Amazon and Microsoft are all doing and Google are all doing this as, as well. But uh, there's a lot of big players out there, you know, pick your favorite flavor. Uh, I'm a big fan of AWS because it's simple and cheap and, uh, and I'm just kind of used to it. So uh, that's what we're going to be using this uh, semester to, to do what we need to do. So what are the key components of infrastructure as a service? Uh, number one, virtualization, right? The ability to fire up servers and, uh, and, and, and scale their um, resources, their compute resources. You know, I can adjust the RAM or compute, you know, uh, processors that are being applied. I can, um, you know, copy my uh, com servers across multiple instances. If I need, uh, you know, 15 of the same thing, virtualization makes it easy to create one and then copy it 14 times. Um, compute, you know, the, uh, compute storage and network are really becoming like a utility, right? They're kind of like cable or electric or anything like that. Uh, I need some compute power to do something. Uh, it used to be I had to, you know, go out and buy a computer and then try to get somebody to get the damn thing set up and bought and all blah, 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 right? Nowadays, hey, I need a computer. You're going to see here in a few minutes that it takes me about five minutes and I got a computer. And it's ready to go with storage and network and uh, we can apply it. Uh, to a problem uh, immediately, right? Uh, so the old paradigm of, of uh, needing to buy infrastructure is is disappearing very rapidly. Um, key considerations with the uh, infrastructure is, uh, you know, security. Um, honestly, I think a lot of these cloud vendors are probably doing it better uh, than, than a lot of organizations are doing in their own data centers because, frankly, they, you know, they hire the smartest folks in the world to develop this type of stuff. They have to comply to standards or, you know, they're going to get sued or have their business model destroyed because they got hacked. Um, so they spend a, a lot of time uh, thinking about security and making things secure. Um, now with infrastructure as a service, you can take all of those best practice things that they do and completely destroy it. and. Uh, and, and make your stuff insecure very easily. And uh, I'll show you how to do that too. <laughs> but uh, uh, the idea is, uh, you know, security is one of the big things you need to think about when, when you're using these, these uh, cloud resources. Scalability, uh, that's one of the great things about it. If, uh, if I need 37 computers tomorrow, uh, Amazon will give me 37 computers tomorrow. And when I'm done with them, I shut them off and I'm done paying for them. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, persistence and, and high availability, uh, you know, being, uh, having virtualization and, uh, and having somebody else being concerned with making sure that all the compute resources exist, uh, everything is being backed up and that type of stuff means that uh, it's easy to persist uh, your compute instances and, and make them highly available because, um, you know, your, your vendors are, are handling that. And then from a cost perspective, uh, it's not free. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in some instances, it can even be uh, probably more expensive than, than certain uh, organizations can do it themselves, right? So uh, the way, the, the analogy that I always use for, uh, for cloud is, it's kind of like health insurance, right? When when certain companies get big enough, they self-insure because they have the capital uh, to be able to take advantage of the, the float in the insurance, right? So rather than pay some insurance company to uh, collect all their money and then pay their claims and, and make a profit off of it, uh, they're large enough that they can just put the money aside themselves and, and pay the claims themselves and save a lot of money. Um, this is the same with liability insurance and, and other things like that. So um, there's a lot of times where if, if you're, you're large enough, you can take advantage of the economies to scale and uh, maybe uh, purchasing uh, or moving your whole data center to the cloud doesn't make sense because it will actually cost you more. If you're a much smaller business or 
you need uh, just a little bit of compute for a little bit of time, uh, then, then cloud is going to make a lot of sense for you. So larger organizations are going to have a mixed bag. Uh, they're going to have in-house stuff and, 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 and public cloud type stuff. Uh, typically, smaller businesses more and more uh, are not going to have any uh, in-house infrastructure because there's really no need to. And uh, one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things about uh, stuff like AWS is, you know, little old me sitting in Omaha, Nebraska, can have all the same things that uh, the big boys have, and um, I can just go out there on the internet and get it. So. Uh, it's really a, a sort of great equalizer and um, computing power, which used to be sort of highly proprietary and, and, and large organizations really could hold a great competitive advantage by having uh, the scale to be able to, to deploy this type of stuff. Uh, you know, that competitive advantage is going away. And at this point, really everybody in the world has the ability to um, deploy enterprise grade software at whatever scale they want to quickly. Um, and so that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So uh, we're going to, we're going to dive right in to how to provision a server on AWS. Now uh, I'm going to make some assumptions that uh, you can figure out how to do things like uh, get MOBA X term and, and, and get, download the real VNC viewer and sign up for the uh, for the Oracle account and uh, the Oracle account really won't be relevant for a couple of weeks for us but uh, um, AWS if you haven't signed up I would encourage you to open your web browser and sign up for AWS right now and uh, and while I'm I'm showing you how we're we're going to uh, do this uh, you know, you should feel free to, to work along and um, and um, you know you can ask questions uh, as we go along. Uh, I'll probably go a little faster than you might be able to, but you're you're more than welcome to sort of uh, treat this a, a little bit like a lab and, and work along as I'm going too. So uh, I see a uh, a question here in the. Uh, chat window and it says, hey, can you give us an overview of OpenStack virtualization project and uh, does OpenStack uh, work similar to uh, VMware? So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be uh, an, an, an uh, expert on, on how OpenStack works, but uh, my understanding is OpenStack really goes a little bit beyond uh, VMware in the sense of OpenStack, uh, from what I understand, is kind of the foundation for a lot of how um, these vendors are deploying these uh, virtualization platforms, right? So it's a really a stack of tools for being able to deploy a cloud, either or private or, or public. Um, I'll be happy to maybe take some time next week and, and dig a little bit farther into that. And, uh, you know, another uh, important concept that I want to mention to you guys, even though we won't necessarily be doing much with it uh, the, or anything with it this semester, is the concept of uh, Docker. And uh, Docker is sort of like the next generation of virtualization. So right now we think about a virtual machine that we install an operating system on and then we deploy on top of a server. Uh, Docker uh, abstracts the um, operating system uh, from virtual machines and basically says, rather than having to carry the weight of your operating system around with you, uh, we will have that be centralized as well and virtualized so that uh, you can just plug your Docker instance into a server that is, uh, has a single instance of an operating system on it and uh, therefore makes uh, you know, virtual machines uh, even more portable and uh, ultimately quite a bit lighter weight and easier to, to move around. Um, I, I will definitely come back uh, to OpenStack and, and some of the other um, stuff that composes that and, and some of the key differences 
uh, between that VMware and and we'll I'll bring up uh, virtual box as well we can talk a lot a lot about uh, a lot of the virtualization stuff that's out there so uh, all right so here is the point where I am going to depart from our um, PowerPoint and and jump right into AWS so uh, what you're seeing here is uh, my AWS console, right? And if we just take a look at this thing, uh, you'll see that I have all of these computer instances that uh, I have deployed at one time or another. Some of them were for other classes. Some are for me uh, with some stuff I do for work. Some of it is me just screwing around, figuring out how to do stuff, right? So I have all of these uh, computers of uh, various sizes that are deployed on, uh, on AWS. And uh, you can see I have uh, the, the server that we're gonna be building uh, uh, up and running here. Um, and uh, you know I've got it tagged as my fall uh, 2016 uh, thing and when we click on this we'll see down below this this concept of virtualization really starts to come in so if we just take a look here at, at what's uh, in this in this bottom panel here you can see that uh, Amazon has provided me a, a public DNS or you know URL to to access my server they also give me uh, an IP address there is a uh, private DNS and IP address that I can use uh, inside of the, the Amazon infrastructure to communicate in between machines. Uh, you can see I have a number of storage devices down here that are connected to my machine. And, uh, and then I also have a number of, I have a security group and number of rules that apply to this machine that basically determine uh, how this machine can be accessed uh, over the internet. Uh, the other thing that you'll see up here is we have this, this key pair and uh, we're gonna discuss uh, uh, how to create and use those. But this is really the, the concept of security and, uh, and a private and public key is what allows me to uh, communicate uh, with my machine at, uh, at kind of the root level. So uh, to make this uh, easy, I'm gonna kind of start from the beginning here and just kind of log out of my account and uh, see if we can't get uh, Amazon to uh, show you a little bit how you go about signing up for this. So um, if you wanna sign up, if you go to awsamazon.com, uh, and I think if you just type in uh, free after that, they have uh, a whole, uh, thing uh, which called the AWS free tour tier and this is really uh, for uh, students or other people who just want to try AWS out um, and what it allows you to do is they have certain classes of computers and amounts of storage that you can use for nothing for up to a year uh, and you can see down here where they talk about the usage that they will allow you and the various uh, uh, things that you can uh, services that you can use basically for nothing for a period of uh, 12 months and then they list software and all sorts of stuff uh, that you can use and if you're doing some uh, you know just sort of one person type stuff uh, this is great um, and and I've used the heck out of it and actually exhausted it um, the it will require you to give them a card uh, a, a credit card either way so that you pay for the stuff that's not on the free tier and uh, sadly the the install that we're going to be doing is is not going to be on the free tier machines but uh, I can promise you they're they're uh, they will not be expensive uh, you will you will have to try hard if you're only uh, installing the or cr creating the server instance you need for this class, you will have to try real hard to spend five dollars a month on it. Uh, Amazon is, is amazing from uh, from that perspective, uh, but they will also uh, allow you to gear up to whatever level of uh, compute resource you need. So it can get expensive quick if uh, if you are deploying 
uh, way over deploying resources that you don't need. Um, and if you uh, also forget to turn those way over deployed resources off. But uh, I promise I will not lead you astray and uh, you shouldn't have to spend too much money on this this semester. Um, we're, uh, so, you know, click this link, uh, sign up for an AWS account. I'm not really gonna walk you through that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Tell them who you are, give them an email, give them a credit card, you're ready to go. Uh, once you do that, you will be able to sign in to your AWS console. And uh, I got all sorts of user accounts for this thing. Uh, I'm just gonna use my, my base user account and, uh, and sign in here. So once you sign in, you should probably see something that looks just like this. And you'll, you'll notice that Amazon has a boatload of offerings out here. Uh, so uh, the ones that we're gonna be primary concerned with is uh, EC2, which is their uh, compute utility, virtual servers in the cloud. Uh, we are gonna be using their uh, Elastic File System, which is basically their, their cloud-based uh, storage. And then, uh, you know, we're kind of touching on the VPC uh, component as well. But the, you'll notice if, if you walk around here and, and play around with this, there's a whole slew of other things out there. So, um, they have uh, the Docker service that I uh, recently, or I just uh, mentioned to you guys. They have a, a container service for that. They have uh, the ability to um, uh, basically build applications and forget about uh, the infrastructure entirely and just let Amazon um, manage the uh, compute resources that your application needs in, at any given time to run your, your app in the cloud. Um, and then they have you know, Lambda, which I'll, I'll let you explore, but it's basically uh, being able to just put uh, code snippets out there on the internet and uh, allow uh, them to respond to events and, and Amazon takes care of uh, making sure that there's a computer to run it for you. And then they have a whole slew of other things, all sorts of storage things. Um, you know, S3 uh, is just basically a, a bucket to dump stuff in. If you have stuff you just want to archive, you can dump it into Glacier and it's very cheap. And uh, as long as you don't need it quickly, you can just dump it in there and uh, it'll, they'll preserve it forever. Uh, they have the ability to deploy databases without you being concerned with uh, having to install software. Uh, it completely auto magical. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to go out and play with that, although we're not gonna use it. Uh, then they have their own uh, database and data warehousing database called Redshift. Um, uh, uh, very affordable compared to what you'll pay for uh, for other things and then just a whole slew of development tools for you to be able to pretty much do whatever it is you want to do off of their cloud infrastructure so uh, I would highly encourage you if you're into this type of stuff to uh, go poke around figure it out uh, I can't tell you that I've played with all this stuff but I've played with some of it and uh, I found it to be uh, an amazing resource. So what we're interested in is we're interested in EC2, right? So if I click EC2, uh, it's gonna take me into uh, EC2 dashboard. So one of the big things you're gonna wanna kinda look at uh, immediately and pay attention to is this concept of region you see over here. So what this means is, hey, what data center are my computers working out of? Now, uh, if you're here in Omaha, uh, I typically use the West region. I found that one to kind of be the best one for me and uh, seems to be pretty responsive. And I like to keep all my instances in one region because uh, if you don't, uh, you start paying the cost of, of communicating across data centers. So it will always be cheaper for all of your applications and servers and EC2 instances to be running in the same place. Um, now, uh, the other great part about this is they give you the ability to replicate servers across multiple regions so you can put them closer perhaps to the people that need them. 
so, you know, pick a region that you're happy with. I recommend Oregon. I don't particularly care what you do. Uh, I'm assuming these data centers that are across the world will be somewhat slower than the ones that are closer to you. So uh, if you're here in, in the U.S., I would uh, assume you want to use uh, one of these U.S.-based um, data centers. So uh, you can see uh, I've got a, a running instance already, which is that uh, area I saw and showed you uh, initially, but the big thing that we're going to be concerned with is this launch instance, right? So uh, this is where it all starts. If I come in here and I click this button, and you are going to come in here and click this button, it's going to ask me, all right, what do you want to do? We're going to create an Amazon machine image or an AMI, right? This is a virtual server in the cloud on the AWS um, on the AWS infrastructure and you'll see that there is a whole pile of these things that you can choose from. Uh, some are pay, some are free, uh, some are free tier eligible. Uh, if you've ever wanted to play with any of these operating systems, well, this is how you do it, right? Some of these are rent the, uh, rent the stuff by the hour type stuff. Uh, so you can pay for the licensing uh, just while you use it. Uh, there's there's tons of tons of options out there. The other thing that uh, and when, what we're going to need is community AMI. So uh, the good people of the world go out there and uh, provide uh, AMIs that uh, have particular types of software uh, already and operating systems already installed on them. And uh, we are going to be primarily concerned with an or Oracle Linux. And um, before we sort of dive into that, I just want to pop back and talk about quickly, you know, okay, we're going to be using Linux, right? So what, um, what is Linux, right? Um, if we scale through a bunch of these slides here quick. Uh, Linux is an open source operating system based on Unix, which is a proprietary operating system, right? So uh, for a lot of your mainframe, big compute uh, type server environments, uh, there's a number of vendors who created uh, proprietary uh, operating systems, you know, referred to as Linux. And, uh, and these cost a lot of money, right? So uh, eventually somebody came along and said, hey, you know, I'm going to just rewrite this operating system from the ground up and um, I'm going to make it like Unix, but uh, I'm going to make it open source and, and free, right? And so it's gained a bunch of popularity. Um, more and more Linux is, is being used all over the place, uh, especially as virtualization and other uh, you know, cost-saving trends have proliferated. Many uh, websites out there in the world are using it. I think I saw a thing the other day that said that uh, something like 67% of known websites were uh, using either uh, Linux or uh, Linux-like uh, operating systems, right? So it's becoming highly popular. Um, and although our Oracle database will run on Windows or Linux, uh, and, and a number of the Unix operating systems as well, uh, Linux is kind of generally considered the preferred OS, and, and Oracle has its own Linux distribution, uh, which we're going to be using, right? So um, if I go back to our AWS console. One of the things you'll notice about if, I, if we were to look up Linux, there's a bunch of different flavors of it. And because it is open source, um, a lot of folks are able to uh, produce their own version of it. So if we look over here on the left side, we'll see that Amazon has a distribution of Linux. And these are CentOS, Debian, Fedora. These are all like Linux uh, operating systems here. Uh, Red Hat, uh, Red Hat uh, Ubuntu is, is very popular. Uh, we're gonna be concerned with Oracle's distribution because Oracle um, uh, produces their own version of Linux uh, so that they can distribute and, um, 
put their software on it, right? Now, uh, Oracle software will run on a number of different Linux distributions, but one of the things Oracle does with their distribution is offer support for it. So for what is basically a, a pretty cheap fee, you know, I wanna say a couple hundred bucks a year for your server, you can sign up for support for Oracle Linux, and then if you have a problem, you can call their support organization and, and they will help you. Right, and Red Hat sort of the same thing too. Uh, Red Hat has a deal where you can sign up for support, and um, and then they will support you on that operating system. So anyway, the the particular operating system that we're interested in is Oracle Linux, and it's version seven. So if you type in uh, OL seven into this community AMI search, you'll see that we get a list of. Um, uh, the most recent uh, community AMIs that have been produced for this. And we're going to use the most recent uh, Oracle Linux 7 update 2 for x86 64 64 bit architecture server using the uh, HVM because this is the one that uh, really um, Amazon recommends using in most cases. So there are different types of virtualization. If you are interested in the difference between HVM and PVM, I would encourage you to go out and, uh, and search on Amazon's uh, support site and they'll tell you all about it. So, okay, I want this OL7.2 uh, you know, version of Linux that somebody's been so kind to produce for me. We can see that this is a 64-bit uh, architecture, and if we click Select, it's going to say, all right, well, what kind of computer do you want for this thing? So, uh, in a perfect world, we'd say, hey, we'll take the free one. Uh, but the uh, database software that we're going to be installing actually requires a little bit more than uh, this free computer uh, offers. So I have found that this T2 uh, medium instance will, um, will uh, do pretty well for you know, basic Oracle database install and will perform well and uh, doesn't run into any errors or things like that. Right. So if you just check the box next to the T2 medium, uh, you can see over here it's kind of uh, recommended for low to moderate use. And I would say that uh, pretty well uh, defines what we're going to be doing. And then uh, the thing it's going to tell us about storage over here is, hey, uh, it only uses the elastic uh, block storage. Uh, and you can get into better performing storage if, uh, if you want to if you want to pay them more. Uh, if you're interested in what any of these type of instances cost to run, you can go out and Amazon has an extensive price list that shows you how much it costs to run each one of these instances with various types of storage per hour. Uh, it may seem a little confusing at first, um, but uh, if, if you look at it, uh, it's, um, it's fairly self-explanatory. Really where you get into the big cost is with pushing lots of stuff across the network. And, uh, and we're not gonna be doing that, so uh, that's why I don't think we're gonna run into too much uh, from a cost perspective this semester. So uh, down here you can see the next option is to configure our instance details, which we're gonna wanna just basically take the defaults on. If we take a look here, um, it's just kind of telling us, hey, this is what your network's going to be. And, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and allow it to assign us a public IP, which means that every time we start and stop our machine, we will get a different IP and DNS address. But uh, that's great. We're not trying to create a website. And, uh, and uh, static IPs uh, tend to get expensive. So we're not going to bother with those. Uh, then we're also saying, hey, you know, we want a shared hardware instance because uh, we're all about the cheap. And so if uh, if we, we could get a dedicated instance, but they would obviously want some more money. And then you can uh, apply all sorts of monitoring to your instances uh, should you want to. Uh, we're not going to bother with that because, hey, they want more money for that too. Uh, and then we're just going to do uh, one instance here. and. Um, and so you can basically uh, accept the defaults that this thing uh, comes up with for you. So next, and the super important thing that we have to be concerned with is storage. 
our server comes with a 15 gigabyte root volume, right? So this is basically the storage uh, that is used for our operating system. And that will not be nearly enough for us to do the things that we wanna do with our Oracle database. And uh, it is super handy to be able to kind of chop your storage up into bits so you can move it around. Uh, one of the great thing about storage volumes is you can actually detach them from one machine and connect them to another, right? So this is particularly handy if you have uh, downloaded a bunch of software that you want to install and you've got all the zip files and and all that type of stuff. You can put it on a particular drive, which we're gonna do. And rather, uh, every time you wanted to go out and maybe install that software again on a new server, rather than having to re-download it, you can just attach that storage volume to that machine and, uh, and have all that uh, software there. So, I mean, this can apply with all sorts of, uh, you know, anything that you want to be able to move around uh, from a from a directory standpoint, you can do that way. So that's why I am a big fan of not just grabbing one giant uh, new storage volume, but actually uh, creating several of them for the purposes that we need. So uh, we're going to use three drives on the server that we're going to use on this semester. The first one is going to be a five gigabyte drive. Uh, we're going to use that for swap space, right? So swap is what your computer uses when it's out of memory. Uh, so when it doesn't have any RAM, it uh, will use the swap space uh, uh, to basically perform the same function and park stuff there uh, temporarily while it, uh, while it does its processing. And uh, there is a a uh, particular swap space requirement for an Oracle database and uh, our five gigabytes here will be uh, more than sufficient for that purpose. Uh, the next thing that we're going to need is we're going to create a 10 gigabyte drive and we're going to use this to store the software that we're going to download. So uh, I think the Oracle download is a little north of six gigabytes. Uh, there'll be some other software that we pull down. So I found 10 gigabytes is is a uh, is a nice volume to uh, to add there to to store all the software we download, and then lastly, we're going to want a thirty gigabyte drive for where we uh, install our Oracle database, right? So this will accommodate our database software and will also accommodate any data that uh, we put on it. Uh, conceivably, we could make this smaller. Uh, but I found 30 to be a nice round number, and uh, it um, generally I don't have too many problems running on a space here. Um, one of the things you'll learn as you get into this is you can actually uh, deploy drives that are specifically for Oracle database data files, and you can move data files around that way if you wanted to. Um, We'll uh, talk about that more in the future. Uh, but the beautiful thing about Amazon and this storage thing is you can come out here and, and deploy more volumes at, uh, at any time and attach them to your instance and sort of add storage on demand. Uh, so that's highly flexible and a, and a beautiful thing. And it, it's one of the things that makes uh, this type of stuff uh, such a great uh, tool set. So uh, the next thing, uh, oh, the other thing you'll see is, is these sort of drive identifiers they put here. These will be important uh, because uh, the only thing that will be attached to our computer by default uh, available to use is this root volume. And we're going to have to go out and actually uh, tell our computer that these other uh, storage volumes are available to it and uh, we will attach them and uh, and, and make sure that uh, they're available for use in, uh, in the future. Uh, the other thing that you see over here is this delete uh, button here. One of the options is to delete on termination. Uh, generally with your root volume, that's kind of what you do. So this means that if I decide to delete this server, the storage volume will go with it. These others are not checked, right? So. Uh, if I decided I just wanted to move these drives to another server and delete this one, I could delete this server, my root volume would go away, but all of these other volumes would persist, and uh, I would have the ability to attach them to uh, something else. So, uh, next, tag your instance. This is a good idea. 
because you know it just makes it easier to recognize uh, when if you start getting a bunch of uh, servers out there so this is particularly important for me because I've got a pile of stuff so this you can pull whatever you want in there you know name it Fred if that makes you happy uh, that will give you uh, a way to identify it when you're looking at your at your panel so here's where we get into networking right so you can see right here that by default it opens up port 22 which by the way is how you connect to your machine using SSH uh, and it basically says, hey, anybody on this here planet Earth can connect uh, via uh, port 22 to this machine. You'll notice that you can set this to a particular IP, or it will actually pick up your IP if you like. Um, I'm kind of fond of saying anywhere, because I usually have pretty, one where you, you have to have a, a key to be able to attach, so it's relatively impossible for somebody to attach to your machine in the first place. Uh, the other thing with the my IP thing is typically your router is going to switch this on you as, as time goes by, so this can just get frustrating. So I set it to anywhere, um, if you were doing this inside of an organization, this would obviously be a bad idea. These are just development boxes for us. Uh, should somebody do something horrible to it, then I would say that uh, they got too much time on their hands. Uh, we're going to need to add a couple of uh, additional rules for our machine, right? Uh, because we are going to need to uh, allow other communications to happen uh, to our machine. The most important one is 1521 because that will be the default port that our Oracle database communicates on. Uh, and we will say anywhere for that one as well. So this is what will allow uh, you or somebody else to connect to your database from anywhere on this here planet Earth, like we're saying. So uh, one of the things you'll test after you get a database uh, installed is the ability to uh, connect to it uh, from somewhere else other than your virtual machine just to prove that you can. The other uh, rule that we're going to need is we're going to open port uh, 5904, which is the port we are going to use for using VNC. So the VNC uh, software that you're going to install on your machine is going to use that port to uh, connect to your computer and, uh, and show you your desktop. So uh, you can come back and jack around with these rules at any time. But this is just kind of the two things I know we're going to need right now, so why not get them out of the way? So after we have done all of that, uh, we're actually uh, ready to fire this thing up. So if you click review and launch, uh, it's going to just give you a couple of warnings and basically say, hey, it's not really the greatest idea to have your ports open to the whole world. And so we know, yes, thank you for that. Uh, then the other thing it's telling us is, hey, this instance isn't eligible for the free usage tier. So uh, we knew that as well, uh, but uh, these are good things to know. Uh, so now, uh, you know, I could review this, but I'm pretty confident in, uh, in what I've got here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go ahead and click the launch instance. And now it's going to ask me for a key pair. So uh, I've already created one, but I'm going to go ahead and create another, just show you how it's done. Uh, create a new key pair. So you need to give this thing uh, a name. So you need to have this key to be able to connect to your machine with your SSH client. Uh, so when you create it and download it, uh, put it somewhere where you're not going to lose it or, um, or it becomes kind of a pain in the butt. So uh, I'm just gonna create uh, a new key pair, call it fall 2016 demo. And it's going to associate this with my, um, with my instance, and it is going to give me the key, you see it downloaded it here, um, that I need to be able to connect, right? And so um, I recommend maybe not leaving it in your downloads folder and and uh, dragging it off somewhere that you need it. Um, so if you look, uh, if we look here at, uh, at my local machine, you can see it dumped it in there. I'll just drag this key file over to my 
uh, directory that I'm using for this course. And then um, there you go. So now we say launch instances and it's saying, hey, I am working on firing this thing up for you. So if you will be patient and just give me a few minutes, I promise to create you a brand new computer. So this usually takes maybe two, three, four, five minutes to get fired up and so it requires patience. Um, and what, what I can show you while that is happening is the, the other thing that's gonna be real important that you do. Um, so one thing, I've got this, this instance over here that's already running, right? And so uh, one of the things that's important to know how to do is start and stop these machines. So if you select your particular machine and you come up here to actions, um, you'll see that you have this uh, ability to change the instance state. So I can reboot it, I can delete it forever, or I can start and stop it. Um, the other thing you have the ability to do is actually create images, right? So this is, I can create a backup of my machine. Uh, this is a, a good idea and I can show you how to do that here. Oh, somebody have a question? No, all right. Um, so uh, one first thing you need to get uh, comfortable with is, is being able to start and stop these machines. So we can see this machine is uh, running. I'm gonna come out here and say stop. It's gonna say, hey, you sure you wanna do that? And I'm gonna say, yeah, right? And so now when I stop this thing, I am, uh, once it is stopped, I am no longer paying for the compute power it uses. And this is the beautiful part about Amazon. So if you leave your machine on all the time, you will be charged for it all the time. If you shut it off when you're not using it, you will not be charged for it all the time. Now you still have to pay a little bit for the storage, but honestly it's something like, uh, like five cents a month per or two cents a month per gigabyte or something, right? So it's ridiculously small amount of money for the storage. Um, so really it's the compute and, and networking that uh, will add the cost up. If you remember to shut your machine off, uh, I promise you, you'll never have any problems. Now the other thing to do to protect yourself from yourself is you're going to want to actually set up a billing alarm. So if you come over to your username and go to billing and cost management, you can do what's called sitting, setting up an alert. Now uh, this is gonna switch the region that you're in um, so just be aware of that when you go back to find your machines. Now, uh, you can see that, hey, uh, Arthur, geez, you're spending like 20, 30 bucks a month. And yeah, I know, but I screw around with this stuff a lot and I have a bunch of machines that I refuse to let go of and about 10, probably five petabytes of data out there at this point. So um, in any case, you saw with all those virtual machines I have out there, I have a hard time spending 20 bucks a month although it appears I'm doing a little better this month, probably because I've been messing around getting ready for this class. Uh, so you can see down here, I have uh, an alert set up uh, for my estimated charges. Now, um, you can also set up alerts, and um, the way to do that, I think um, it's easy for me right here. When you come into this page, you should see basically, uh, hey, set up an alert. Um, I'm gonna go out and show you uh, the alert I have set up, and I'll show you how to set one up. So uh, you can see right here, you'll get to this alarms area, and you have this ability to create alarm, and I've got one set up already that basically says, hey, if, uh, if I'm spending more than 10 bucks, then, uh, then I want you to send me an email. Uh, the way to create alarm, you click create, um, it should give you a bunch of metrics. You're going to be interested in a total estimated charge metric. And uh, you're basically just gonna wanna um, come down here, click this, uh, this two week metric and say, hey, you know, anytime my stuff gets over, you know, 10, 10 bucks for two week period basically is when I'm gonna wanna want to hear about it. So really uh, all you have to do here is select your metric and then you can click this next. 
Um, here's where it lets you give your alarm a name. So uh, I'll call this my demo alarm. And I say, tell me about it when I want to spend more than $10. Uh, alarm and then uh, you have to select uh, something from a notification list you're to, if you don't have a list set up you just set a new list put your information in it and then this will allow you to say hey uh, send Arthur an email or send yourself an email when my uh, my instance uh, violates the alarm that I've set up so once you've got that uh, set up you just say create alarm and then um, this thing will, oh, I must have forgot something on this thing. This thing will send you an email anytime um, you uh, exceed the uh, stuff that you've set up here. So let me just jump back in here and see what I didn't do. probably just didn't pick up my, uh, I may not have saved my notification here. Oh, and you have to give it a, a time period as well. Um, there you go. So I'm gonna set this thing to maximum alarm notification should pretty much do it so um, let's just take a look at this other alarm I don't know what I'm blanking right there on that thing so if we go into this alarm you see I've got estimated charge set up for the six hours and notifying me and basically the this is just the maximum period to, for it to look over um, go in set these up they're pretty self-explanatory uh, that one I'm messing up there uh, sure I just click something wrong I don't want to screw around with it too much but if you have any problems feel free to get in touch with me I'll help you get your alarm uh, squared away and uh, we'll make sure that you don't uh, end up with uh, you know any charges you weren't expecting so now what I want to do is actually switch back to the EC2 dashboard. So I'm going to click uh, just the big Amazon box and then click EC2. And you'll see that it's got me in this northern Virginia zone, which is where the alarms are out of. And I don't have any instances in that because I created all my stuff in Oregon. So I'm just going to switch back to the uh, Oregon zone here. Click on my running instances and you will see that the uh, computer that we just set up is in a running state and uh, conceivably ready to go. And if I click on this thing, we'll see uh, down here in this panel, it gives me the IP addresses to connect uh, to the computer. So now that we have this information and our server is up and running, we can actually go out and, and connect to this thing. So uh, I'm just going to drag my uh, AWS panel over here, and then I'm going to fire up uh, MOBA Xterm. And I'm going to bring that over here as well. All right, so you can see on the one side, I got my AWS uh, dashboard up here. And then on the other side, I've got my MOBA Xterm uh, client, right? And so uh, our server instance doesn't come deployed with a, a desktop already on it. So really what we're gonna concern ourselves with is getting this thing ready to, uh, one, accept an Oracle database, and two, get a, 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 a desktop set up on it so that we can use our, our VNC software on it. So uh, one of the things that will be in the slides here is um, 
really a uh, overview of all the steps that I've gone through. So if you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to remember this. I've got all the individual steps in this uh, PowerPoint and I'll put this up on uh, Blackboard tonight. So you'll have everything you need to kind of walk through and, and set this stuff up, including the stuff that we're going to do on uh, MOBAX term and then the, the commands that we're going to issue to the computer uh, after we're after we're connected to it. Another thing that you'll find out here in this PowerPoint will be a number of the sort of basic Linux commands uh, that you'll need to use uh, in the command line as we're getting this thing set up. And then um, also uh, I'll give you all the commands that you need to do what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you how to do. Uh, as we go along here tonight. So uh, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed because I'm dumping all this stuff on you first night, uh, don't worry. Uh, one, I'm going to give you all the stuff you need to, to get this done. And then obviously I'll be here to help you um, if, if you have any um, problems getting this thing set up. So all right, let's, uh, let's flip back to MOBA X term here. And you can see that uh, it just opens up its own page here. I want to set up a connection, right? So the way that I do this is there's this session tab uh, or panel up here. And if I click on this, it's basically going to say, hey, what type of session would you like to uh, create? And uh, I'm going to say, hey, uh, I want to create an SSH, right? And then it's going to want some information from me. First thing is this remote host. So you can use the DNS or the public IP, whichever you choose to. I'm gonna grab the public IP and dump it in here. So I put my public IP in there and then I'm gonna specify a username. The default username for your uh, EC2 instance is always gonna be EC2 user. That's okay. the user that we're gonna to use to connect to our uh, instance. Uh, the last thing that you really need to do to be able to connect here is you got to click on this advanced uh, SSH setting and here's where we're going to tell it that we want to use a private key. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, surf on out to where I dump that key file and I need to make sure I get the right one. So you can see here that I'm grabbing that fall 2016 demo key that we just created as a part of creating our instance. And so this is what's going to all, you know, allow us to connect to the machine. So once we've set that up, uh, the only other thing you might want to do is give this thing a friendly name uh, for the shortcut that's going to create here. Uh, it defaults to the IP. Uh, I'm just going to call this fall 2016 demo so I know which session it is um, when I look at all the sessions I've got predefined. So now if I've done that, you can see that it automatically goes out and connects to our computer. And you can see that I am connected as the EC2 user um, to the Amazon instance that we created. Um, so the first thing you're going to want to do uh, when you get in here is change a couple of passwords. Uh, the EC2 password uh, in particular because uh, I don't know what the default password for this thing is. Um, but the great part about this EC2 user is it actually gives us access to the root user which allows us to um, do all the operations on the machine that we need to. So your very first task is going to be to change your EC2 user password. And the way that we do that is with a command uh, called sudo, which means basically switch to our uh, super user. And then we are going to use the password command, which is P-A-S-S-W-D. And then we're going to tell it the user that we want to change the password on, which is the EC2 user. So then, uh, as soon as I do that, it's going to ask me for the password I want to use. I would suggest putting something in you can remember. I would also suggest writing it down. Uh, but don't worry too much. You can always reconnect and change it if you have to. And then it's going to want you to put the thing in twice. Let's see if I can do it successfully. 
And all right, that's all there is to it. You now should have been able to uh, change your password to something that you know what it is. All right, so um, that's the very first task of, upon logging in. Now, the next task that we're going to do is we're actually going to start diving into getting this machine um, ready uh, for our uh, for what we want to do it with it, right? So in order to do that, um, there's a couple of things we want to do. One is we just want to check and make sure that this thing is all up to date with its software, right? So we're going to say sudo, and we're going to use a utility called yum, which is really just like an install utility that you use on a Linux machine. And we're going to say update, right? So then that goes out and checks and basically say, hey, is there anything I need to update? And uh, one of the things this thing does when it when it fires it up is sort of auto updates itself. So I would assume it's not going to find anything that you need to update. Uh, the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to need to install a couple of packages that uh, we need um, to uh, make our life easier, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just copy paste these things because I'm pretty lazy. Um, and so you can see I put sudo yum install wget, which is really just a utility for communicating via HTTP. And uh, I'm using this dash y to say, yes, go ahead and install this thing. And then you can see uh, what it's done here is really just run through what's it, the, the packages it needs to install this utility, and it has installed it on our machine successfully, right? So that's a beautiful thing. And you can see I'm running out of screen real estate, so I'm just going to go ahead and use the clear command, and uh, that'll just sort of flush all that stuff from the screen. Now, the next thing that we're going to want to do, and all these commands, like I said, will be uh, in, the, in the PowerPoint that I give you guys, is when you want to um, do this sudo uh, to install Perl. Um, so, uh, I think I can screw, scroll up here, show you the command I put in. Okay, so um, where is it? There it is. So what I did here is sudo yum install, and then I went out and got this uh, Perl uh, library. We just need this for uh, some of the other uh, utilities that we're going to be using uh, in the future. So this is just a little bit of uh, housekeeping to get this instance all set up with the with the software that it needs, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. So the the next big thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to end up creating a. Um, Oh, and I saw a question there. Is it for the private key? Is the full Windows path on your machine? Yes, it is on your machine. Um, so uh, just store that locally, and then uh, that path is is pointing to somewhere on uh, on your laptop or PC or whatever you're using. Um, the next thing <laughs> that we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to create a user on this machine that we're going to use for our um, Oracle install. So Oracle database likes to have an Oracle user and group uh, created, and it has a bunch of sort of specific permissions that uh, um, apply to the database install. And so if you were to go out and look at the documentation on the Oracle database, you can they actually tell you all the things you have to do for your system in order to get it ready for a database install. Now, uh, I have mentioned previously that I'm pretty lazy. Uh, I don't want to have to do all that, and there are scripts that we can run that will do it for us that have been uh, provided by uh, Oracle in, in order to make our life easy. So um, what I want to do is basically just show you here quickly um, sort of how the users that we have on this machine before we execute uh, this particular um, script. Let's try that again. Sorry, sometimes with copy-paste, uh, it gets upset with me. 
So um, basically what I want to do is I want to go out here and I want to get a list of the users that are on this machine. So I think if I type this in, what I'm basically asking it to do is go out there and uh, you know find all the users from this password file that um, that have a home directory, right? Which basically means all the non-system users. So you'll see if I execute this command, this get end password, get end password, and this is just a little utility, um, it'll go out and tell me, hey, I have this EC2 user is the only sort of non-system user that's out there um, so far, right? And uh, if we were going to go out and look at the, at the groups, I've got another little uh, command here using the same get ent uh, utility. And we can say get the groups. And uh, when I use this grep command, it's really just a, a means for um, limiting the results that we return for from what we're searching for. And uh, what I'm gonna do here is just basically tell it to get me all of the groups that are not, um, system groups and the way I'm going to do that is just using a little bit of regex and uh, I'm going to try and be lazy and just paste the rest of this in here and these commands will be in here and I don't expect you to necessarily um, understand these commands or, or or have a you know great deal of uh, you know feeling like you need to really get to know this stuff I just putting it here for the for the purposes of um, of showing you the users and groups that exist on the system here, so let me just go ahead and try and copy this whole thing one more time and paste it in here. We'll see if Windows fights me or not. There we go. So basically, this says, "Hey, go out and get me the the non-system groups," and it shows me, you know, the EC2 user group. Uh, is the only one that's out there, right? And, and the reason I wanted to show you these things is because we're actually gonna now um, install the users um, and groups that we need for um, the Oracle database, right? But we're gonna be lazy about it and we're not going to, uh, we're not going to uh, do this all manually. We're just gonna take a script that's available out there and, and use that. Uh, rather than, than uh, doing all this stuff ourselves, And if I flip back to my um, PowerPoint here quick, um, you can see here's the commands I just uh, executed. And this sudo yum install Oracle RDBMS server pre-install script is the one that we're going to install. And this will go out and get all the dependencies the Oracle software has, install the users and groups that need to be on the system, and make it so that uh, we have what we need in order to, um, to install a database on this, uh, on this Linux machine. So okay, flipping back to MobaX term here, I'm going to go ahead and paste that script in, and you can see um, that uh, it is going to do a whole bunch of stuff, right? And uh, it's putting a bunch of libraries on here. It's going to need for our software, and it will go through a pretty extensive list of stuff. And it takes, you know, not too long, uh, maybe you know, a minute or two, and it will install everything that you need for your Oracle um, database. And now you can see this thing is um, done. I'm gonna clear the screen off again, and then if I hit my up arrow key, you can see that I can arrow through all the commands that I have uh, executed so far, right? So now if we look at the users out there, um, that are on the machine, we now have this Oracle user that has been created for us. And then if we were to uh, do our group query again, we'll see that we now have this O install and DBA groups that have been created for us as well um, that are all for the uh, Oracle install. So, um, 
if you follow along with this, you should be able to check where these things have been installed. Um, and, and then that's basically all the users and, and groups that we're going to need on the machine. You don't have to be concerned with the real mechanics of how to do this. Just run that uh, command that I've given to you in the, um, in the PowerPoint, and, uh, and it'll work for it. So the next thing you're going to want to do is change the password for the Oracle user, right? Because we don't know what that password is either. So again, we're going to issue that same command, sudo to switch to our super user, uh, pass WD for password and Oracle. Um, one of the things I would suggest on a dev machine like this is maybe keep your passwords all the same to make your life easy. Uh, on uh, other machines, this would be a bad idea. This is the dev box, and I think you'll find if you don't have 37 passwords to remember, uh, you'll spend a lot less time screwing around. So I'm going to go ahead and give this thing a password. And then you'll see that I have updated my password. So now the, the beautiful part about this is this allows us to do things like switch between users now. So if I were to issue the SU command for switch user, I could say switch user to Oracle. It will challenge me for the password. And now I am a, uh, a different user uh, on this machine. And uh, if I wanted to go to my user home directory, I could type CD for change directory and then tilde, which is really just a shortcut for going to a user's home directory. And I would now be in my Oracle home directory, which I could prove by typing PWD for present working directory. And you can see I'm in home Oracle. Now, if I wanted to just flip back to my EC2 user, I can actually just type exit, and it will exit me back out to uh, my EC2 user. And if we look at our present working directory, we're, we're back to our home directory for that EC2 user. So uh, now that we have created the Oracle user, uh, one of the last things we need to do for it is we actually need this user to be able to connect, right, uh, remotely to this machine. And, and currently that won't, uh, it won't be able to do so because it doesn't have a key file uh, to associate with our private key uh, if we try to connect. So if we switch over to our Oracle user again, and put our password in, Let's see, I think I'm... Almost positive. Oh, I can't believe I didn't mess that up. And then I'm going to switch to my home directory. And it's very important that the next steps we do are in the home directory. So if you type PWD to tell you where you are, you'll see you're in the Oracle home. We basically just need to create a new directory to hold our key, right? So the way we do that is with the make directory command, which is mkdir, and then the directory we're gonna make is dot, which in Linux basically means hidden, and then ssh, and uh, that makes the directory. So to see if we actually created it, we can use the list command, right? And if I do ls, which is list, I won't see anything because that directory is hidden. If I do ls-a, I'll see the, com the directory and all the other hidden files and directories because uh, the dash a command will actually show us everything. So now uh, what I need to do is I need to change the permissions on this thing and uh, on this directory. And the way you change permissions in Linux is with the chmod command, it's ch uh, mod. And um, I'm not going to really dive too deep into how security works on Linux. You're just going to have to kind of trust me <laughs> with these commands. We'll talk about it a little bit uh, later, but um, for the time being, just to understand that um, this chmod command basically will affect uh, which users groups can access a file. 
Uh, and the way it works is you define permissions for a particular user, a particular group, and then the rest of the world. So um, this 700 is just a, an option to define those permissions. And like I said, I'm not going to make you suffer the pain of talking about that right now. So I'm going to say, hey, change the permissions on that directory I just created. So now that I've done that, I actually want to create a file called authorized keys in that directory. This touch command will basically just create a file for me. So I'm going to say, hey, in this directory, create me a file called authorized keys. All right. So touch means if the file doesn't exist, go ahead and create it. Uh, and I've given it a directory path in the file name. So um, what did I mess up there? Sorry, I must have jacked my permissions up. So um, I've modified the SSH directory. Let me make sure I am where I think I am. And I need to add this directory one more time. So let's give this one more try. Authorize keys. Let's see if I jack something up there. Oh, yeah, I think I'm putting a comma in instead of a dot. That doesn't help. There you go. So now um, it helps if you type stuff correctly. Uh, so I've created this file in um, in our SSH directory. And if I really wanted to prove it to myself that it existed, I could switch to it. Um, and the way I would do that is just change directory and then I could list and I'd see that this authorized key file exists. So the next thing that I really need to do is I need to put my public key in there, right? And, um, and Amazon has created a, a utility for doing this. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste this command in here. And you can see we're just saying, hey, go get from essentially what is this uh, web service, uh, this uh, key file and put it into our uh, authorized key file that we just cr created. So um, I think I need to be one directory up in order for that command to work correctly. So I'll arrow up to get my command one more time. And all right, you see that executed. And so now if I really want to prove to myself that uh, this actually did something, I can uh, switch back to that directory and I can open my authorized key files with VI, which is Vim. And you'll see that, hey, look, there's a, there's a key uh, that will be used, right? So if I just hit uh, colon Q, I can exit the file. And now at this point, I've done everything I need to do in order for our Oracle user to be able to um, connect uh, remotely. So now um, what I can do is actually come back over to my sessions and, uh, and change uh, the user that's in my session. I'm going to go ahead and put Oracle in as the username and uh, say OK. And then if I double click that, it will open another window. And you can see now if I've done everything correctly, I'm now connected as this Oracle user to, uh, to my remote instance. Um, and this really uh, gets us to the point of everything we need to do from the perspective of setting up the, the user that will be used to create an Oracle database on our machine. Now, uh, the last piece that we really have to do is um, set, attaching our storage to our machine and then setting up our, uh, our VNC software to work. So, Storage is, um, 
the, the way that we can kind of look at this storage, and I, I'm going to jump back to my EC2 um, user here to, to look at this stuff. So in this session, if we wanted to see the, the storage devices that were, were um, available to this machine, we can use a command called lsblk, and this lists all the storage blocks that are attached to our machine. And you can see that these, these labels right here correspond with the stuff that you'll see in the AWS panel. But the one thing you'll notice is these things, uh, save for this root volume, aren't attached to the machine because there's nothing to the right of them mapping them to a directory. Um, they're also, at this point, just raw storage, right? They haven't been formatted. So we actually have to format these disks um, for, to be used as a part of our uh, file system. And, uh, and again, I'll give you all of these commands to do this type of stuff. The, the first thing that uh, we're gonna wanna do is actually create our uh, swap uh, drive, right? So the, the way that we do that is we issue a command called make swap. And I'm gonna copy paste again here. And what this will do is actually format this XVDB drive to be swap, which is just a particular type of um, storage. Or So if I issue that command, it basically says, hey, I'm gonna format this thing as, as swap space, and, um, and it, it's quick and easy, right? So the next thing we need to do is actually turn that swap on, make it available to our system. And right now, if we were to type the command free-m, we would see that um, this swap, there's no swap available here, right? But if we, if we say, hey, uh, use this for swap space, and, uh, and issue that command again, we'll now see that that five gig of space has been added and is available to the system to use. All right, so now the, the only thing left to do is to actually format the other drives, and that's really pretty quick and easy. Those are just gonna be formatted as regular, what's called ext4, uh, which is just a file system. Um, and so uh, we're gonna take the, the C drive, which is gonna end up being where we store our software. Uh, we're gonna format that as a, as a regular file system. So we just issue that command, and then we're just gonna issue that exact same command for that uh, D drive as well. And this is gonna format this as a ext4 regular file system. So we have, now if we type uh, that same ls block command, we're gonna see that, hey, all this stuff is, uh, is actually um, formatted now. But it's still, and we can see our swap is listed as swap, but it's actually not connected to anything uh, on our system, right? So if, uh, if we were to switch to the, the, to the highest level of our current file system, I'll leave my screen off here, I'm sorry, clear. Um, we would see if we did a list command, here's all the directories that exist on that root drive, right? And uh, you'll notice this U01 directory over here, which is where we're gonna install our database. We wanna mount one of our drives to this, which basically means when people go to U01, the storage is gonna be on one of the storage devices we created. And we're actually gonna wanna create one more directory at this level. So I'm gonna use sudo and make dir and I am gonna create a, an inventory directory or IMV. So now if I do that same list command, you'll see that that IMV directory has been created. Now, in order to mount those drives uh, or associate them with the directory, um, we can actually do that. And there's a file uh, that the system uses to, um, to associate those, but we can actually mount them uh, using a command manually if we wanted to. I'll just show you how that's, uh, how that's done quick. So if we use the mount command, 
we can say pseudo mount we give it the drive and we say we want this mounted at this directory and then we can actually do the exact same thing for our d drive and we will mount this at that u01 directory so now if i do that issue the ls block command one more time you can see that the storage devices that we have formatted and attached to our instance are now mounted at particular directories, which means, hey, they're available to use, and everything that gets put into those directories will actually get put on these individual storage volumes that we have mounted. Now, manually mounting our storage is something that uh, we don't want to do, right? And so the last thing I'm going to show you tonight in the, in the few minutes we have less is just how to set this um, storage up so that it is um, so that it is uh, automatically mounted every time we restart our machine. So one of the things I'm going to want to do here is just uh, should be able to easily just unmount uh, these drives. Um, and now I'm going to do the same thing to the INV. And the only reason I'm going to do this is to kind of prove that the next thing we do works. And now, uh, if we look, they're no longer mounted at those directories, so they're not available for us to use. Now, there is a file called fstab on the system that associates um, storage volumes with your, your machine. And when you start your machine up, the operating system goes and looks there and, and does what it has to do based on the information that you get it. So we're gonna use our uh, Vim editor, which is, is called by using VI, and we're going to switch to this uh, system directory, etc, and we're going to open this file called fstab. And so when we open this thing up, you'll see right here, it's got this sort of squirrely UID thing. This identifies our root volume, right? And it refers to it sort of in machine language instead of what we think of it as. But all we need to do to make sure that, uh, that our drives get mounted is actually put in those same sort of commands that we um, were using before. So I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna hit the I button to be able to actually write to this file. I'm going to come to the end of this line and just create a new line. And so in order to, um, the commands that we actually need here, I'm just going to copy paste them in the interest of time. So we need uh, the information for our swap drive. Let me copy and paste that in. Oh, and I accidentally copied that, my bad. All right, so that's the entry for that uh, XVDB that uh, tells it it's a swap drive. And then I am going to put the information in for the C volume, which mounts to our INV directory. And so I'm gonna go ahead and paste that. And then I'm just gonna put the same in for our D, which mounts to our U01, which was that 30 gig drive we had. And so now if I haven't done anything horrible, uh, horribly wrong here, uh, this should just work. So to write this file, I'm going to hit the escape key to turn insert off. I'm going to hit colon, uh, W for write, and Q for quit. And, uh, and I promise you uh, I'll have you out of the command line here uh, by next week, but you just have to deal with it for now. So now if I want to prove that this works, if I type the, that block command, we still don't have anything uh, mounted there because we haven't actually uh, refreshed the system. But if I is, uh, issue this command um, sudo, for super user mount and dash A to say basically use that FS tab com, uh, file. If I've done everything correctly, I won't get an error. And when I issue that command, we'll see that our drives are now mounted again. And this means now that whenever, uh, basically you never have to think about uh, your storage volumes again, right? Unless you wanna come out and either detach a volume or uh, mount another one uh, to the system. 
So once you've gotten to this point, you have uh, formatted and attached the storage that we allocated for this machine. And uh, you have ensured that it will always be attached to your machine every time you start or restart it. Um, the, and, and that basically gets us to the point where our, um, our uh, instance is pretty much ready to go. Um, the last really couple command, well, actually we only have one more command that we have to get through and we'll be done for the week. So the last thing we really have to do is change the ownership of that INV directory and that U01 directory. So if we wanted to look at the ownership right now, I, I type in ls-l, you would see that this INV directory is owned by our root user and this U01 is owned by our root user. So uh, that will not work for installing our database because Oracle requires that the Oracle user be the owner of the directories uh, where the software is gonna be installed. So we wanna make it the owner of where we're gonna park all the software install stuff because we want it to have permissions and we have to make it the user, uh, uh, the owner of the U01 uh, directory because uh, it's required. So there's a command for changing ownership called C-H-O-N, O-W-N. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just paste this in here. Sudo change ownership recursively to the Oracle user and the O install group for the INV directory. And then we're gonna issue the exact same thing for our U01 directory. And now if we do that same uh, list command, we should see that the ownership for INV is changed to the Oracle user in the O install group and the ownership for the uh, U01 directory is Oracle and O install. So that is everything I wanted to get through uh, with you guys uh, this week. Um, what we're going to be doing next week is actually uh, installing a desktop on this thing and accessing it with VNC Viewer. And once we get through that, you will have learned everything you need to know uh, to get a 100 on your first assignment. Uh, so um, I would encourage you this week uh, to go, if you haven't done it already, Go out there, get your uh, your EC2 instance deployed, and uh, I'll post this. Uh, um, I'll post the PowerPoint here in just a couple of minutes, and uh, and get your server uh, set up. Now, if you have any problems, you get stuck, please feel free to email me. You may Skype me anytime I'm available. That includes during the day. Um, if I'm not available and I'm up on Skype, I'll just ignore you. So you'll know I'm not available. Um, so send me an email and we can, we can set up a time. Uh, we can jump on Skype. You can show me your desktop and, uh, and we can get you through, uh, any, uh, problems that you're having. Uh, I'm hoping that I have not overwhelmed you too much uh, with everything I've thrown at you this week. I promise you that uh, you will become comfortable with this stuff if you just sort of follow along. Uh, we'll get you there. And uh, it gets easier uh, as, uh, as you begin to digest some of this information. So get out there, play with AWS, get your machine set up. If you have any problems, get in touch with me. Uh, I'll help you. So um, that's everything I have for this week. If nobody has any questions, uh, we can go ahead and, and sign off. And then I'll be available uh, via Skype here until 1030 as a part of the uh, office hours that I've set up. And so if you would like to talk or you have some other machines that you did, or other questions you just wouldn't, didn't want to uh, address while we're here on with the group, feel free to Skype me. Um, You'll need to send me a connection request. If uh, if we take a look here at my Skype profile, you'll see that I think I can show my profile. Um, there we go. 
you'll see my username is Arthur Dayton. And uh, I got my picture on there. Um, so if you send me a request and say, hey, it's so-and-so from class, uh, we can connect on Skype, and then that'll give us the ability to do screen sharing and, and everything we need to do from, uh, from the perspective of me helping you uh, remotely. So all right, everybody, uh, have a good week. Good luck. Have any questions? Any questions before I uh, sign off? Um, we I'll, for me, I join you late, so I'm gonna go through whatever you just thought. Okay. And if there's any question, I'll get back to you on Skype. Okay. Yep. And uh, I will post the uh, the entirety of this lecture uh, online. I'll get it up to YouTube. Uh, something this big probably take a couple hours, but I'll send you guys a uh, a uh, message tomorrow when it's available and uh, and where to find it on YouTube. Uh, otherwise, if uh, if anybody wants to talk, just uh, reach out to me on Skype and uh, I'll hang around uh, as long as I need to tonight. Otherwise, I'm going to sign the meeting off. Everybody have a, a good week, and uh, I'll talk to you all next week. Thank you. All right. Bye now.